All right, here's my recording of the exam two review for microeconomics. And I'll be going over the practice exam, which is 40 questions. And so I recommend that you follow along with me. I won't be writing out every single question in this exam review, but you can have it pulled up uh, on your computer while you watch. Okay. So question one asks, a rent ceiling set below the equilibrium rent can create which of the following? And in this case, let's just review what a rent ceiling looks like. So we've got some demand function and a supply function. We have an equilibrium price and an equilibrium quantity. And let's suppose, as the question says, that a rent ceiling is set below the equilibrium rent. So here's my rent ceiling. All right, so the rent ceiling, is it going to be binding or non-binding? Well, remember that it prevents us from going up above it. We would be up above it if we weren't, if it weren't for the rent ceiling. And so it is binding. So we're going to have some new quantity supplied and some new quantity demanded. And of course, the result is a shortage, a market shortage. And in addition, there is, so I'll just kind of do this, some sort of deadweight loss that emerges. There is a decrease, obviously, of producer surplus. And there is potentially a net increase in consumer surplus. Remember, those customers, those consumers who end up in the rent control departments, they do benefit, right? But in net, there is still some deadweight loss, and potentially there is a net loss of consumer surplus as well. So I'm doing this in the yellow-ish, orange-ish colored box there. And the reason I say there is potential loss here is because some consumers end up suffering from increased search time. Whoops. Search time or increased search costs. And if it's a sustained rent ceiling for a long time, then it can also result in black market activity. Black market activity or underground economic activity. Okay. Now, what we do not see is that a larger number of apartments is rented, right? In fact, we end up at a quantity of QS star there, which is less than the equilibrium quantity. So actually, fewer apartments are rented out. This is not a more efficient allocation of housing because we've got the presence of deadweight loss. And of course, we see a change in the number of apartments rented from equilibrium quantity, E sub Q, to QS star. And so the only option that remains is increased search costs and black market activity. All right, question two. Which of the following is an economic policy that promotes the efficient quantity of apartments? We're given a sales tax, presumably on uh, a market for apartments, which we have no reason to believe is inefficient. 
or causing some sort of negative or positive externality of any significant size. Other options are a rent floor above the equilibrium price. And another option, a rent ceiling below the equilibrium price in the market. And we have none of the above as an option. Okay. Well, recall that a sales tax is going to create a deadweight loss. A rent floor above the equilibrium price is binding. That's also going to result in a deadweight loss. And a rent ceiling below the equilibrium price also causes a deadweight loss, what we just saw in the last example. So the answer is none of the above. None of these particular economic policies promote the efficient quantity of apartments in a market for apartments. All right, let's keep going. A rent ceiling results in a shortage of apartments. As a result, there is. And then we've got some options here. So let me just go back to what I did earlier. So the first option is that there's only a loss of consumer surplus for tenants. That is not true because we have a loss of producer surplus. That there's a gain of both consumer and producer surplus. This is also not true. Only a loss of producer surplus for landlords. Almost, right? Getting closer to the truer picture each time. And finally, a loss of producer surplus and a potential net loss of consumer surplus. Bingo, that's our answer. Remember, there is a net loss here of producer surplus. Originally, it was this big triangle. Then it reduces down to this smaller triangle in red. And then, of course, in net, so long as there's not increased search costs or black market activity or some other uh, unintended consequence of this policy that has a major effect on consumers, then they could potentially have an increase in or a net increase in consumer surplus. But it's more than more likely the case that they're going to have a potential net loss of consumer surplus. All right, let's keep going. Question four. Question four, we have a market. And we're given a supply function. And we're given two demand functions, D0 and D1. We have a quantity of 300 here, quantity of 400. This is quantity of 500. This is a price of three. This is a price of four. And then we're also given this, which is completely irrelevant, but it's there to test you. Okay. So in the figure above, the demand curve shifts rightward from D0 to D1. So we imagine we're first here at this equilibrium. And then we move up to this equilibrium. All right. So the question tells us that there are no rent controls in place. So in the short run, the increase in demand results in, and the op options, once we look at them, uh, appear to show us obvious, the obvious right answer. So what do we see here? We see higher rents. By the way, these are measured in hundreds of dollars, so it's from 300 to $400. And then we also see an increase in the equilibrium quantity. Easy peasy. This is chapter four stuff. Just simple supply and demand shifts. Now in question five, we're given the same figure. We're told that the demand curve shifts from D0 to D1. 
and so that D1 is now the relevant demand curve. And suppose that the government imposes a rent ceiling of 300 per month. All right, if it makes it easier, let me just erase D0. Okay. So you don't see this. No reason to have that obscuring our sites from what's most important. And then let me draw out the rent ceiling. Okay, or we'll call this price ceiling. Okay. So now we're asked what's going to be the effect. This is just a simple price ceiling problem now. Okay. Well, we can see that with the price ceiling in place, suppliers are only going to supply 300 units. This is QS star. And we can see that consumers are going to demand QD star, which is 500 apartments. And so we have a market shortage. So this is our market shortage. And by how many units are we short? Well, 500 minus 300 gives us 200 apartments. All right, moving on. Question six. A price floor results in what kind of outcome? So we've got some options. That it always results in a shortage that it always results in a surplus, that it results in a shortage, we've got a condition here, if the floor price is higher than the equilibrium price, and then finally that it results in a surplus if price floor is greater than the equilibrium price. Okay, so it should be obvious to you that option A, option B are both wrong. All right, price floors don't result in shortages, so that's out, and they only result in a surplus if, and only if, the surplus is, or I'm sorry, if the price floor is binding. And a price floor is only binding when it is above the equilibrium price. Option C is also incorrect. Don't result in shortages, right? It's not true that a price floor will always result in a surplus, only if it's binding. And likewise, for price ceilings. Price ceilings only result in shortages if it's a binding price ceiling. That is, if the price ceiling is less than the equilibrium price. Let's move on to question seven. This is question seven. We're given a table. We have the wage rate. We have labor supplied, measured in millions, labor demanded, also measured in millions. We have different wages. Okay. We have different numbers of workers who would enter the market at these different wages and supply their labor. Then we have firms who would demand a certain number of workers at different wages. Okay, and we are asked, what is the equilibrium wage rate in an unregulated market? Basically, government is not imposing a minimum wage here. So in this case, simple supply and demand, right? We know that the equilibrium in the unregulated market is going to occur where quantity supplied equals quantity demanded. And that's right here. Okay. Quantity demanded is 5 million, which is also equal to quantity supplied. 
And so the wage rate is $10 per hour. Question eight follows right behind this question and provides the same table. And, but suppose that a minimum wage is set at $11 an hour. So now this is our relevant um, row here to be looking at, okay? So we're asked the number of unemployed workers will be how many? Well, we can see that this is a classic pri uh, um, price floor. So we've got demand for labor, supply for labor. This would have been five and 10. We have a price floor. That is the minimum wage set at 11. Is this binding or non-binding? Clearly it's binding because it's above the equilibrium price. So we got four uh, million workers demanded, six million workers supplied. The number of unemployed workers in this case would be two million. Okay, let's keep going. Question nine. When a sales tax is imposed on sellers, we can imagine a hypothetical supply curve shifted to the left, such that the vertical distance between the original supply curve and the new supply curve, that is S plus tax, equals what? Well, in this case, we're doing what we've done many times in class. We have a supply function. We have a demand function. And then I'm told that there's a tax that's imposed on sellers. I imagine a new function here called S plus tax, in which case the vertical distance between these two functions, right, no matter what point I pick, right, no matter what quantity I pick, the vertical distance between these two supply functions is equal to the amount of the tax. All right. Question 10. We have a tax problem here that we need to solve. We're given two supply functions. This is our S with the tax. Then we're given a demand function that passes through at a quantity of 15. and quantity of 10. The original price in the market was $12. And it's going to be $12.80. At this point, we really don't need Okay, so this figure shows the market for books before and after a sales tax. In this case, it's an excise tax, so per book is introduced. Each week, the tax creates a deadweight loss of blank, decreases consumer surplus by blank, and decreases producer surplus by blank. Well, let's calculate that deadweight loss first. Now, I want to identify a few points here. This is going to be the new price that buyers pay. This is going to be the new price that sellers receive after the tax is paid. And this distance here is the amount of the tax that buyers are paying per book, which you can see here is 80 cents. This distance here is the amount that sellers are paying in taxes per book. That's 40 cents. So 
how large is this tax? The tax is a dollar and twenty cents per unit. Okay. So let's uh, keep moving. Let's calculate the deadweight loss. The deadweight loss in the market is going to be this area plus this area. Okay. I didn't get that. Could you try again? Sorry, my Apple Watch is going off. Okay. So this is the deadweight loss to consumers. This is the deadweight loss to producers. So let's calculate this first. It's going to equal one half times base times height so times five times 80. Okay. And what do we get? It's going to be 0. 0.4 times five. Let's see here. It's going to be two dollars and then the dead weight loss to producers It'll be one half times five times 0.4 it's going to be one dollar so together the total dead weight loss is equal to three dollars now we're also asked by how much does consumer surplus decrease each week well, it decreases by $2, but keep in mind that consumers are also paying the tax. So their consumer surplus is decreasing by the amount of the tax as well. It's going to be this rectangle here. So it's the amount that they're paying. Well, they're paying $0.80 cents per book in taxes times 10 that's eight dollars this is equal to the tax paid by consumers what about this the amount that producers are paying in the tax um, I'm gonna say tax tax paid by producers this is gonna be 40 cents per book times 10, that's $4, okay? So every week, consumers have a reduction of consumer surplus in the amount of eight plus two. So uh, net loss of CS equals $10 every week. At loss of producer surplus each week is four plus one, so that's going to be five dollars per week. So the final answer should be three dollars for the dead weight loss, ten dollars lost to consumers, and five dollars lost to producers every week. 11. Comparative advantage implies that a country will, <clears throat> in this case, export those goods in which the country has a comparative advantage and import those goods in which the country does not have a comparative advantage. That one should be pretty easy. So 12. A country opens up to trade and becomes an importer of sugar. In the sugar market, consumer surplus will blank. Producer surplus will blank, and total surplus will blank. So let's check this out. A country opens up to trade, becomes an importer of sugar. So I have a demand curve. This is my domestic demand. I have a supply curve in the domestic country. And... And then, <clears throat> I guess I could show my equilibrium price, my equilibrium quantity. And then they open up to trade, and they import. What that tells me is that the world price, the world price 
must be below the equilibrium price. Otherwise, they wouldn't be importing. They would be exporting. So what do we have here? This is going to be the new quantity supplied by domestic producers. This is going to be the new quantity demanded by domestic consumers. The difference here is not a shortage, but the difference is the quantity of imports that are coming in from other countries. So what happens here? We can see this is the new producer surplus for domestic suppliers. And this is the new consumer surplus for our domestic consumers. And this amount here, shaded in light blue, this area is new surplus. Remember that international trade is a positive sum game between two countries. That is, both countries end up better off than they were before. Now, is every single individual in each country better off? No. Clearly, domestic suppliers aren't a fan of having to compete with all of these imports. But consumers in the domestic country are so much better off that in total, we end up with a larger amount of total surplus than before. So the answer here is that consumer surplus increases. Producer surplus in the domestic country decreases. And total surplus increases. All right. Let's go to question 13. Question 13, we're given a table. We have price, we have quantity demanded, and we have quantity supplied. Various prices, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. Quantity demanded, 100, 95, 90, 85, 80, 75. Oh, that looks like a 6. I mean that to look like a 6. It's supposed to be a 5. Okay, quantity supplied, 70, 75, 80, 85, 90, 95. Based on this table, at what world price would the country export the good? Well, first, I realized that without trade, this would be the equilibrium, right? The equilibrium quantity would be 85, and the equilibrium price would be eight, eight dollars. Okay, eight and 85. So in order for this country to export, the price has to be above the domestic price. This is our world price. So will they export at a price of 10? Yes. Will they export at a price of 12? Yes. Will they export at any other price higher than 12? Yes. So the answer is that this country would export the good at any price above 8. So any price above $8 per unit. All right, let me pause the video here, stop it, and I'm going to record a part 2.